Good morning and good evening to our viewers joining us from around the world. My name is Brooke Spellman and I represent Education USA and the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs at the U.S. Department of State in Washington, D.C. Today's Facebook Live is about college admissions and how to apply for study in the United States. We want to give you, the viewers, the best advice on applying to a U.S. college or university. Our hope is that international students like you are able to come to study in the United States. There are 550 Education USA advisors in 180 countries and territories around the world offering free advising services to help you. During the program, we will be answering questions from lots of viewers. If you have any questions on the college admissions process, please post them at any time during the program in the comment section below. So I am very excited to introduce our speakers, who collectively have a wealth of knowledge in the college admission process. Joining us in the studio is Gayatri Atkin. She is Director of International Admission at Fairleigh Dickinson University. In this role, Gayatri helps students from all over the world understand the academic opportunities that are available in the United States. Welcome. Thank you. Joining us virtually from Denver, Colorado, is Mary Margaret Herman and Nguyen Tong Vi Vo. Mary Margaret is the International Enrollment Operations Manager at the University of Colorado, Denver. Mary Margaret and her team work together to help prospective international students learn about CU Denver programs and assist them through the application process. Mary Margaret is joined by Win Tong Vi Vo, who is an international student at the Business School at the University of Colorado, Denver. Welcome, Mary Margaret and Tong Vi. Before we get started, I would like to ask our viewers to answer our Facebook poll question. What aspect of studying at a U.S. college or university would you like to learn more about today? The options are A, choosing the right school, B, the application process, C, financial cost, and D, living in the U.S. Again, to our viewers, please tell us what aspect of applying to study in the U.S. you would most like to learn about in, in today's interactive. And we'll share the results later during the program. Thank you. So Gayatri, I want to start our discussion today by talking about admission timelines. So what should international students keep in mind when applying to a U.S. college or university when they're thinking about timelines? Thank you, Brooke. Um, I suppose the most important aspect of it is going to be the fact that it's never too early to start mm -hmm. planning. Mm -hmm. um, many of us international students come from very different e education systems and we have different academic calendars. And planning for how soon we're going to be able to navigate the system, mm -hmm. um, the variety of different application types mm -hmm. in the United States, the fact that all universities very often share different types of application systems. Mm -hmm. All of those are very important factors to consider. We look at international applicants in very different ways, depending on the type of institution we are. Um, in the United States mm -hmm. and very often there are lots of questions to navigate in those applications. There are common applications that students can use to access certain mm -hmm. schools. There are schools that offer individual applications on their very own websites. Um, and so the application fee is a consideration, how many schools you would like to choose to apply to, all of these are important considerations and the timeline is the most important mm -hmm. because it's never too early to begin mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. uh, we Aside from the transcripts that you would report to your schools um, when you're applying to schools, you're going to be looking at other elements of the application process, mm -hmm. which are the letters of reference, for example, mm -hmm. um, a statement of purpose, an essay question, depending on the institution that you're applying to. Mm -hmm. All of these require good preparation. Mm -hmm. um, and we also have academic credentials that, are, that go beyond transcripts. Mm -hmm. Certain institutions would look for credentials that you would need to apply to a university in your own country, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, such as, for instance, in, say for example, in regions like South Africa, you'd mm -hmm. have the matriculation exams, and those are towards the end of the calendar year, mm -hmm. but the results might not be available at the time that a student would start applying. Mm -hmm. Many schools consider applications towards 
start of November and the deadlines for applying depend on whether or not scholarships are also involved. Mm. So if you need a scholarship, you're going to need to apply well in advance, mm. especially mm -hmm. if that's a consideration for right. whether or not you study in the United States. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Good. Good points. Mm -hmm. um, and so as students gather all of these documents together um, and pu pull together their application package, um, can you um, tell us a little bit about the standardized testing process and what students should expect as they're going through this process um, and looking at standardized tests and the different choices there? Certainly. Standardized testing seems, it could seem potentially mysterious to many right. students from overseas, um, outside of the United States. Um, but it's a way of kind of placing everyone on a slightly standardized scale. Mm. That's the idea of the test. Um, many schools waive tests such as the SAT. Many mm. schools require tests such as the SAT or the ACT. Mm -hmm. um, some schools will require just the TOEFL or IELTS or English proficiency tests right. such as those. Um, so it really depends on the institution the student chooses to apply to. But standardized testing can take time because right. again, you have to prepare in addition to right. your existing academic coursework in high mm -hmm. school. Mm -hmm. So that level of preparation also comes into the timeline question from before. Right. Um, so that's, it's a lot of planning that is involved in this process. Exactly. Standardized testing is one part of the application, but there's also non-standard uh, things that are part of your application process, mm -hmm. such as extracurricular activities. Mm -hmm. Those are the creative aspects of the application that really tie things together and right. bring the applicant to a full human being from the perspective of an admissions reviewer right. or an admissions counselor. Um, and the extracurriculars are important because as admissions reviewers, mm. we can then see what kind of interests the student mm. actually has and whether or not our institution is going to be a good fit for them. Right. That's right. Um, and things such as your art portfolio, supposing you're applying to an art school, your audition and recordings for music schools, right. uh, performing arts, etc., auditions for theater, acting school, and so on. Mm. Um, so it's really an interesting type of process to apply to a very different country for um, admission to schools that are going to be very different to the education system that you're used to. Exactly, exactly. So, very yeah. insightful, thank you. You're welcome. So Mary Margaret, over to you. I'd like to talk a little bit about location. So with over uh, 4,700 accredited institutions in the United States to choose from, how do students choose where to go? And how does location play into the student experience? Right, so we live in a very expansive country and uh, there are so many different cultures within the United States and uh, different topographies and uh, types of climate climates to choose from, right? That's in addition to both the urban, suburban, and rural environments that you might want to select from. Maybe you're from a small town and want to try out a big city or you want a more peaceful environment, so you want to go live in a more country-like environment um, and in a, a rural space. Or um, maybe the location where you want to go has access to major sporting events or some dancing, right? It depends on, on your background and what you want to study, what you'd like to have access to. Uh, you want to also make sure that you're selecting a climate that's uh, that works with your um, your your personal experience, right? So you may want to stay in a place where you have 300 days of sunshine, like Denver, and you have access to four seasons. Um, you may want a warmer climate because um, I know that's very important to some people. Uh, also taking into account uh, access to airport and public transportation, um, as well as the cost of living to live in a specific location. And I know that safety is very, very important and well so as well. So, you know, really picking a, a location where you feel safe and welcome and like you can make a home there. 
Excellent, thank you. So Mary Margaret, there, an, another common question that we get obviously uh, from international students are what options are available for them to finance their education? Um, can you tell us a little bit about this? Right, so um, financial aid and scholarships, they're not gonna always be in one full package. Um, sometimes you'll be getting uh, funding from different sources, or sometimes you'll be paying out of pocket fully. Um, we provide an I-20 amount that is based on what we think you'll actually spend here. And, and the cost can really vary based on the student. Um, uh, and with financial aid, there's so much variation as, as well. So for example, here at a public institution, you wouldn't have uh, access to federal funding here in the US, but we do have scholarships up to half off tuition for our undergraduate students. Uh, at the graduate level, you may be relying on uh, graduate assistantships rather than scholarships, or there could be specific scholarships for your location or what you're studying. Um, so there can be a lot of different options. Um, we also have students like V who work on campus. You can, um, at a lot of institutions, uh, work on campus for up to 20 hours a week. Um, and then there are different uh, institutions that do have more personal funding sources available to students. Great, excellent, thank you. So V, uh, we'd like to turn now to you um, because I know a lot of viewers would like to get your perspective as an international student. So can you share with us uh, a little bit about why you decided to study in the US and what was your experience with the application process? Okay, so um, as an international student, the application process is not just we just apply for the school, but we have to apply for the US visa and you know, which is, that is an essential step to study in America. Uh, you know, at first stage, I tried to find a school with relatively high rankings and like suitable with my financial budgets of my family. Also, I want to live in somewhere that I can get a job after graduating. And so I chose CEO Denver, whereas Mar Mary Margaret is working here. Uh, then I applied to CEO Denver, which is the right decisions I have made with me the most interesting part in the application process is that when I apply for school since I did all the documents myself without any help of any agents so I found some difficulties in research the information about a school on the website mm, you know uh, I still remember some days that I had to stay up late to 2 a.m. because of the wrong time in Vietnam and in America and you know, the most happiest moment that I ever got is when I got an email saying that, congratulations, you are accepted to see your Denver. I'm so happy, I was so happy at that time. And you know, besides those steps, applying for a scholarship is a crucial part since um, my family budgets cannot cover all the tuition fees. And I also want to share to everybody that some people says there's no way we can get a scholarship because it's too hard, it's too difficult or something. But for me, like, it's totally wrong. If you are trying your best to well perform in your current school and like involve in extracurricular activities, you definitely can get a scholarship. So just be confident, be yourself, and you can get what you want. Excellent. Um, yes. Uh, uh, regarding a trusting to life in the US, Oh, go ahead, Tongbi. Oh, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, you know, up to now, I have been here for two months, and although it's not long, I'm getting used to living and studying here. You know, at first, I have uh, like hundreds of concerns about where to live, where to eat, means of transport, um, like bank account, purchasing textbooks, and especially English, since it's my second language and I can't understand 100% what people are talking about. So luckily, like after that, with the support from the school, I figured it all out. 
I found a Vietnamese family here to study, uh, to study to live with them as a homestay. And I go to school by bus and the light rail, which is quite interesting, though it takes some time. Uh, I felt so excited when I went to the bookstore to get my ID and my bus pass card. Uh, I have to bring that with, with me like every time, all the time, because if I forgot it at home, I could be kicked off the light rail, and, and which is not so fun in this weather. Oh, I'm talking about weather in the Colorado nowadays. It's beginning with snow. And you know, this is my first time in my life seeing snow, which is so that oh, I did take some picture and send to my mom in my hometown. Oh, fantastic. Yes. Uh, Great. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, V. That's, uh, we're so glad that you're adjusting well and your English sounds fantastic. So well done. Um, we viewers, we are now ready to, to share the results of our Facebook poll. Thank you for everyone who participated. So just as a reminder, we asked everyone to tell us about what aspect of studying at a US college or university they most wanted information about from today's broadcast. And the top answers were, one, the application process. So 41% of responders said the application process, which um, we have talked about today, and we can delve in uh, a little bit more later on. And then the second top um, uh, choice was choosing a school. 27% of respondents uh, mentioned that. So uh, Gayatri and uh, Mary Margaret, what do you think about those two top choices? And is this something you hear a lot from students applying to your universities? Gayatri, let's start with you. Yes, indeed. Um, the application process is quite a mysterious one mm. um, for many reasons, primarily because we're usually comfortable with that with which we are familiar. Mm. And for a student who goes to school in one system to get into the university system is a common, um, it's a commonly tread path. Right. And so it's easy to ask around and family and friends should be able to help. Mm -hmm. It's a very brave thing to mm -hmm. decide to study overseas. Mm -hmm. It's a very courageous step. Yeah. Now with the internet, there's a lot of information that is available out there. There are lots right. of advisors. And as you said, Education USA does a wonderful job providing mm -hmm. a lot of information to students who are interested in pursuing studies in the, U in the United States. Institutions in the US too can help. Mm -hmm. All of our schools, will have at least one email address to which you can write mm. and inquire about the process if you have any questions. A lot of our information is already on our websites. Mm. Um, information about how to obtain letters of recommendation, mm. how to write personal statements, those are very specific questions that Education USA can certainly assist with, mm. um, particularly in regions where we aren't familiar with the concept right. of getting a letter of recommendation because right. the education system might not require it. That's right. Um, so those are, those are in important questions mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. address if you have any questions about those. Um, students are welcome to email us and contact us Excellent. to ask. That's good to know. Yes. Thank you. And Mary Margaret, uh, what do you think about those top two choices? Again, is this something you hear from students uh, quite a bit? Yes, it is a, a question that we hear from students quite a bit and we try to provide uh, resources for students to use, um, whether it's a, a short video or a webinar. Um, Sometimes we're chatting with students all day long on our, our website, uh, on Facebook. We have a WeChat um, and a WhatsApp to connect with students as well. And we have um, four student assistants in our office that are pretty awesome in terms of helping out uh, international students go, go through the application process and make sure that they feel very clear about each step. I think also um, because the application varies and the requirements vary uh, so much between institutions, um, you can become a little bit lost in that. The way that we try to simplify that for students is providing uh, credential evaluations in-house. So um, making sure that you don't have to spend the extra money on um, a credential evaluation uh, report. Um, and that is very helpful as well. And then you're able to interact with our credential evaluation specialist to talk about whether or not you'll have transfer credits if you're transferring from another institution. Um, 
what do what what does your GPA look like in the US and your, the amount of credits that you've taken and we really try to work um, really personably with students and make sure that they have an experience where they're feeling taken care of even if they're you know not working with an agent like the um, so lots of resources, sometimes it takes some, some digging, but I would always say, like Gayatri said, is to reach out to us directly. We have a, uh, a phone number, uh, we have chat, we have email, and I, and I know that a lot of institutions do the, the exact same. So we're always here to help. Excellent. Great. Thank you. It's good to know that there's that um, option of direct contact there. Uh, so now I think we're ready for some questions uh, from our viewers on Facebook. Uh, and I'd like to turn to the first question. Do I need to take a language test like IELTS, TOEFL, or Duolingo to get admitted? Now, let me turn that over to Gayatri since she talked a little bit about um, testing in the beginning. Um, what's the answer to that question? It's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> um, so mm, there will be a language requirement, uh, mainly to assess where the student's English proficiency lies, mm. because most of our institutions in the United States are going to conduct classes in English. Mm. So at some point or the other, we have to assess the student's or the applicant's ability to s communicate in English. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whether or not that specific English test is going to be required mm -hmm. depends on the institution. Mm -hmm. Some schools mm -hmm. might consider an SAT verbal score mm -hmm. in lieu of any of those English tests. Some student schools might require both. Mm -hmm. And uh, it really depends on where the student is coming from as mm -hmm. well. The dif mm -hmm. different types of education systems sometimes will waive mm -hmm. that might qualify the student for a waiver of the English proficiency test. Mm -hmm. So it really depends. There are many students who come from countries where English is an official language, mm -hmm. but not necessarily the only official language. Right. And therefore, there might be additional requirements. Right. So it depends. And some institutions offer, for example, intensive English language programs once students get to campus, correct? Indeed. Yeah. We do supplement the student's uh, English academic um, proficiency. Essentially, we provide English placement testing on campus. Uh, many schools do that, I believe, mm -hmm. just to be sure that the student's background is truly going to be you know, suitable to succeeding at the institution. That's right. And we give them additional coursework to support their academic experience at the school. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for that question. So now on to question two. What is the difference between undergraduate and graduate programs? Mary Margaret, can you help us with that? Yes. So uh, um, undergraduate programs are typically started right after you complete the uh, equivalent of a US high school degree. What's unique about US institutions is that we have a couple different types. And I, I know we didn't talk about this before, but we have uh, a lot of community colleges which offer uh, what we call a degree. So you could do two years and finish an associate's degree at a community college. Um, and then those cre credits could be transferable to another four-year institution so that you can get the, you can get the, uh, the bachelor's in science or a bachelor of arts degree, which um, is a standard undergraduate uh, degree here in the U.S. Um, we are on the Auraria campus, which actually is home to the Community College of Denver and Metropolitan State uh, University of Colorado. And so we have a lot of students that do transfer over from these institutions nearby and we take all of their, their credits. So it's possible to go to uh, a community college and, and save some money on tuition because sometimes those institutions uh, have more, uh, have lower tuition costs and then transfer into one of, one of the four-year institutions. Um, at the graduate level, you know, you're, you're really picking your specialization and kind of digging in a little bit more. Um, some, of, some of the undergraduate degrees can be more generalized. We, uh, a liberal arts education is very popular in the U.S. and 
Um, that really involves uh, creating a well-rounded student who knows a lot about different subjects. The graduate level is really where you're gonna, you're gonna hone in on that, that uh, specific topic that is your passion and you're uh, going to be going to school probably for a shorter amount of time unless you decide to continue with PhD. So um, at that point in time, you know, some institutions offer all three, right? So the University of Colorado is a large public research university and a doctoral university. So we offer degrees all the way from undergraduate up through a PhD. Um, some undergraduate institutions are just undergraduate only, and there, there really is such a variety. So um, also what I find is that, you know, if you don't know what your path is, that's okay because a lot of schools have great advising built in to help you figure out what path you, you want to go. Excellent, thank you. Thank you, so that clarifies uh, the different levels a little bit. Next question, uh, am I allowed to work while studying in the United States? Gayatri, what's, what's our answer to that? Definitely, mm. you're allowed to work um, on a student visa up to 20 hours per week. Um, and many schools have several departments that would love to hire international students to work um, on campus. The primary object objective, of course, is to study. And so always make sure that it fits in with the academic schedule. Um, but yes, indeed, students are allowed to work on campus. It's a good opportunity to get experience with time management as mm -hmm, well, mm -hmm, to kind of balance mm -hmm. your schoolwork with um, career work. Right. Um, and also a good experience of the workforce and the work right. environment in the United States as well. Right, that's right. And can you tell us a little bit about um, after your studies, the OPT program or optional practical training? A little bit. So there are two types. One is CPT, curricular practical training, which is just before you graduate. And the other is OPT, optional practical training after you graduate. We at our school, at Fairleigh Dickinson University, we advocate for curricular practical training because that allows you to get work experience while you're still in school. Mm -hmm. And it's a good introduction into the workforce right. again, into the real world as we call it, outside of the university. Um, and you can get academic credit for it mm -hmm. as well. Um, OPT is after you graduate, you finished your degree program, you're allowed to work for up to 12 months. Mm -hmm. Um, in most programs, you could potentially get an extension on that if you're in certain subjects um, that are permitted by the Department of Homeland Security. Um, and it's a very worthwhile experience because it allows you to get practical insight using the education that you've just procured at the institution. That's right, right, putting it to use. Yes. Exactly, thank you. You're welcome. Great, next question. I have an international baccalaureate, IB, diploma with two years of courses in English. Do I have to take a TOEFL? So Gayatri, back to you. The eternal testing question. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and it is a puzzling question because mm. it always, it, it baffles students because it makes sense to them that there shouldn't be a test of English required. Mm -hmm. um, Fairleigh Dickinson University has a very broad English proficiency policy mm -hmm. and it, it's a very, um, forgiving policy, I would mm. say. And what we do is we shift the focus onto the placement test mm -hmm. that the student would take upon arriving on campus. Mm -hmm. So in most cases, we would waive the test of English for a student mm -hmm. who has studied in an English-speaking environment, right. uh, depending on the country. And we've listed all the countries that qualify for that. Right. But that's to say our school would accept that and waive a TOEFL. That right. doesn't mean that every other school in the US would. Right. So right. It's, a, it's a challenge because like we discussed over 4,000 universities in the US. Exactly. So it is a challenge. Right, right. It's a challenge yeah. to find that out, but it's important because that yes. could affect choices and Absolutely, and especially eventual. the timeline. Right. Because you have to plan. That's right, <laughs> that's right. Back to the timeline, exactly. Yeah. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. So um, we've got a question from Nepal. Um, <clears throat> is it okay to be undecided about a major? And how does that affect the uh, college selection process? What do you think, Mary Margaret? <laughs> Yes, yeah, so as I, I said before, that is perfectly acceptable. And uh, we have uh, a great, we have our Center for Undergraduate Exploration and Advising here. So that's 
very long, fancy name for our advising team, but they really, they do assessments with students to figure out um, what their personality type is, how they work, what their passions are, uh, where they want to be located, um, really what work that, you know, makes them come alive. And they work with students to really help them hone in on what subject areas they can be studying in. And oftentimes, uh, students may pick more than one major. Um, we also have opportunities to uh, combine and create your own major, um, which, uh, you know, if that's the type of personality that you are, like more power to you because you really can create uh, uh, a plan of study that, that really you're inspired by and you feel excited by. I myself had two majors and then I went on to study something else in my, in my graduate studies. And uh, speaking of graduate studies, you can always specialize in a, a particular area as well. Um, so there, there really are a lot of, of options, um, but we do have the resources in place to help you really make a decision and not be uh, wasting your time and, and money while you're at school. We make sure that you do get on a, a good path and, uh, and really get going with your studies. Good to know. So Mary Margaret, our next question I'm going to ask you to um, answer as well. And it touches on something you mentioned earlier when we talked about the difference between undergraduate programs and graduate programs. But one of our viewers wants to know a little bit more about the difference between community colleges and universities. And can you tell us right. a little bit more about that? Okay. So we have uh, community colleges that have general areas of built similar to a, a university, except that you're going usually for a shorter amount of time. So the standard degree is called it an associate's degree. Um, it's very well recognized here in the US. The, the level of education is pretty much the same um, and it's recognized by the larger uh, four-year institutions um, and doctoral institutions. Um, you can also do a, a technical degree as well. And these institutions um, are usually public, publicly funded. And so they're able to get state funding to keep the, the costs low. Um, you'll find you'll get a great connection to the community that you're in. A lot of community colleges have a nice range of students, uh, all the way from a traditional student starting, you know, right out of, high school to uh, some, some lot lifelong learners who may be a little bit older than you and have different backgrounds. So there's really just a great opportunity to expand your community and really get to know who is there in the city of Denver or wherever you choose to study. Fantastic. Excellent. Thank you. So our, we've got a lot of uh, uh, viewers asking us about one other uh, aspect that I'm going to ask Gayatri to help us out with, and that is the main components of uh, a college application. So how do admissions officers actually review applications? I'm sure, I'm sure it differs by institution, but what's most important? Is it grades, essays, or is it experience, extracurricular activities? Yeah, this is going to be a long answer. <laughs> It's really interesting how different schools weigh the different components. Mm. And a lot of it has to do with the selectivity of the institution, the, the, the competitiveness of the applicant, mm -hmm. and the number of the type of program that they're applying to, mm. a number of different things. So supposing, and I, I hate to generalize, but I would have to, mm. <laughs> because I work for one institution and there are several in the United States, and this is a very general question that is important to many people. Mm. Um, supposing I was applying to a highly selective institution mm. and my application, say I have a 3.9 GPA mm. and I have very high SAT scores mm. and the criteria are listed carefully on the application itself. The school has made it very clear, this is what I need mm -hmm. to apply. And yet, letters of recommendation, the essays are all mandatory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In that kind of a situation, 
that letter of recommendation that essay those could push you mm -hmm. above the competition mm -hmm. to get into that institution mm -hmm. supposing a different institution right. looking to find a good fit mm -hmm. between the applicant and a program a very specialized program um, say for example hospitality management mm -hmm. Um, they're looking for something within the student's essay or the statement of purpose that mm -hmm. indicates that they understand what the program is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that they are interested in that particular field. Mm -hmm. So that information comes across through those supplemental items. Right. The GPA alone might be spectacular, but they may not understand that hospitality management is different to hospital administration, for example. Right. So things like that that come out during those little other components that we don't think about. Right, exactly. So it really is yeah. the whole package. Definitely. Um, and it does depend uh, uh, on the institution. Yes. Right. So the more you so. know about that institution, probably the better you can tailor that. Exactly. Application. And the nice part about it is we're all accessible. We can contact us and ask us because we're very willing to help students navigate that process. We understand how difficult it is for international students to understand how difficult this process is for them for exactly. being so far away. Right, excellent. So we're here to help. Thank you. Thank <laughs> You're welcome. You. So a viewer from Cameroon has asked a specific question for Mary Margaret. How long does it take to receive an admissions decision from most universities? <laughs> well, uh, that depends on the application cycle for specific institutions. So um, some have specific dates that they're going to tell you, you know, you're going to receive a decision during this time. And those are usually the very highly selective universities um, that have a specific process. Um, for our institution, uh, it really, it really varies per student because um, some students have, have some, it takes longer to get their uh, credentials in, so their, their transcripts, getting them sent to us. Um, and then, uh, you know, undergraduate students, it takes a little bit less time to make a decision because there are less transcripts to look at and evaluate. Um, we have a rolling admissions process, so um, really, you know, it, it can take, you know, 30 days up to a couple a couple of months, depending on those transcripts. I think that's really the, the part that makes it take the longest. Um, but we try to get decisions to students as quickly as possible because we know that you want to prepare to, uh, for your visa interviews and to get here and get acclimated. Um, so we do try and move that process along. So our office, we make decisions every Tuesdays and thir Thursdays. Um, we have our committee and we, we chat and then we make our decisions and send them out. So we try to do that uh, very quickly for students. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Excellent. That's very helpful. Thank you. So Sherup asks, how can we apply to colleges that aren't listed in the Common Application, the Common App? So for Gayatri or, or Mary Margaret, um, perhaps you could first, and I'll turn to Gayatri, perhaps you could first explain what the common application is and then, um, and then answer the question, if you don't mind. Certainly. Um, just as it sounds, it's a common application for a select number of schools that have signed up for it. Um, schools that want to apply or want to receive applications from students who choose that very big, very comprehensive common application. Uh, that means you submit the one large app, you choose the name of the institution that you're applying to as long as it's available on the Common App, and you can apply to a number of different institutions using the same application. The question is, what if the institution you want to apply to is not on the Common App? And the answer is simple. If you know the institution, find them on the website and find them on the international, you know, the World Wide Web, and look at their website, find their information for international students and either email them and ask them what the process is or you should actually see it once you get to the international web page. Right. Many institutions have been very careful about providing information to international students. Right, right. So it should be clear. Should be clear. Right, right. But Excellent. Thank you. So students from Nepal and Bangladesh have asked, if they take a gap year, will they still be competitive to apply to study in the U.S.? Mary Margaret, what do you think? <laughs> Yes, of course, that is extremely popular here in the U.S. Um, even Malia Obama did a gap year. So 
uh, we think that is a, a great opportunity for a student to, um, if they have the, if they have the resources to, um, to really learn about themselves and, and prepare for the, the college environment. Um, because it, it is a lot. You're taking on basically a full-time job and if you're going to work, you know, you, you've got to, you've got more to do and more to manage. So, uh, I think, I think it's great when a student chooses to do a gap year and I think they perform just as well as, as students who are, are not doing a, a gap year. And there are opportunities to come to campus early for summer camps and summer programs to take your time in getting acclimated to your new environment and community. And I think that that's really important to take that time and, and come early and give yourself the space to, uh, to really feel prepared for the beginning of your studies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's right. Would you agree, Gayatri? Yes, yes, I do. And partly also because sometimes it's necessary, mm -hmm. depending on the calendar year of mm -hmm. the country in which you're studying. Um, it might not align with the, U the US calendar mm -hmm. or the academic calendar, and therefore you would need to take some time in order mm -hmm. to prepare for your application to come study in the United States. Right. Um, it might be also wise if you had a very rigorous curriculum during your high school years mm -hmm. to take time to prepare for your standardized tests, get all the documents that you need. Mm -hmm. Um, a prepared application is usually better for both sides, both for the university as well as for the student and their family mm -hmm. um, because it allows you also the time to prepare for funding and the relocation. There's so much that's involved in studying abroad. That's right. um, more preparation is always good. Right, right. <laughs> good, good, good. Yes. Thank you. So several students have asked if they have a poor or low grade point average GPA in high school, will they still be able to study in the U.S.? Although I think that answer probably depends again on institutions. Um, what do you think about that? I'm sure you've seen that case uh, in, in several applications in the past. If the answer was that they couldn't study in the US, I wouldn't be here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I consider myself to have had a poor GPA when I was in oh, school, no. in high school. <laughs> um, because my, uh, that wasn't my fit, hmm. I was not comfortable in the Sri Lankan education system. Mm -hmm. I grew up in Sri Lanka for mm -hmm. most of my life and I decided to come to the United States after watching television. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> and I was excited about the system because I felt it was a very kind education system. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize that the idea of a GPA mm -hmm. is a very complex thing mm -hmm. because in our country, we tend to think that our, the standard of achievement is mm. so much higher mm. than what it translates to in the United States. Mm. So it, it's very difficult to answer that question because first you have to figure out what is my GPA mm -hmm. and then assess whether the school considers that to be your GPA. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then what is the school's admission criteria? Mm -hmm. um, that's a simple answer. Mm -hmm. Additional information will also supplement an application. Mm -hmm. So in other words, if a student has other skills mm -hmm. that the university could benefit from, that the university could help the student cultivate right. um, towards professional success, like artistic ability, athletic ability, right. um, so many other things, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's where the finding the good fit is right. the biggest challenge and the biggest uh, opportunity right. in the United States. It's one of the few countries in the world that offers that ability to start mm -hmm. over mm -hmm. and to build from almost nothing. Um, and there are several institutions that consider forgiving a student for a poor high, high school mm -hmm. GPA, assuming it's poor by mm -hmm. our, our standards as well. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. So it definitely is one indicator, but there's more to, again, to the whole yeah. package and to the whole application that students are submitting. Indeed. There's actually one more piece to that, um, financial ability. Mm -hmm. The financial resources that are available to you will shift. Mm -hmm. um, if you have academic or other skills that the university can benefit from, you will still be allowed to qualify for a scholarship. Mm. If, however, you're coming in and you need a second chance to begin and start your academic history again, to rewrite your own history, you might need to pay more money in order to get your education. Mm. So to be cognizant of that, right. um, that's the, the sad part of it, but it's the truth. Right. 
So good, so good to keep in mind. Keep that in mind. Right, yeah. right. Excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. So, uh, Tong V, some viewers are asking uh, how the campus and classroom experience in the United States is different from um, your home country. And you shared a little bit in the beginning, but uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that and what you've experienced? Yes, uh, of course. This is a very interesting question because, you know, like in my home country, like based on the mindset of Asian people, like we rarely raise our hands or raise our voice in our class. But when I moved to university in America, like everything is different. Every people is so active and they can raise out, raise the hands like every time, all the time when be uh, like during the lectures, mm -hmm. like our professors very like listen to us and answer our, our questions very well. Uh, besides that, um, I really like my professors because she is so kindness. She's so kind and she's so dedicated. That helped me a lot. Although my English is not very good, she will try to support me everything I ask and help me get along with um, every people here. Uh, besides that, I have a lot of friends, which is a very good, very, very great experience here because I'm a social person. I make a lot of friends from all over the world. They're from India, from China, from Mexico, Peru, and so on, a lot of places in the world. And I think uh, the difference between US and some countries, and some countries, universities in some countries is that um, extracurricular activities, because here we have like a lot of extracurricular activities and for specific for international students, as well as for, uh, for students in general, mm -hmm. and like as for specific school, as well as like business school or a liberal art or some specific major we have, uh, we offer uh, for international students as well as for students specific events for us to attend. Excellent. Excellent. Now, can you tell us a little bit, our next question is about letters of recommendation. Um, and I'll ask um, Gayatri to jump in after you, but what did you do for your letters of recommendation and how many did you have and were they in English? Um, yes, of course. Um, actually, in Vietnam, I was in a university that is an international school of business. So everything there was taught in English and I have my professor will be, uh, he is an American too. So I asked, I asked him for a letter of recommendation, but I think the most important thing here is that you have to uh, prove yourself as a very good student that you have like your own achievement that, and the person who will, who will recommend you to the school, just like a person who just um, evaluate it and prove it to the school. So just to make sure, like the, the point is that yourself, you have to um, uh, make efforts yourself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's right, that's right. So you have to choose those people that write your letters carefully so that they are able to really present you in a positive light and they know you and your strengths. Yes, yes, yes. exactly. Now, um, Gayatri, it, I know it depends on the institution, but what would be the average number of letters of recommendation if required? And obviously they do need to be in English, correct? Yes, at least an English translation, if it's not in English. Um, and we would also be able to get translations depending on the country. Um, but we ask the student to provide a sort of a rough idea. Um, typically at the high school level, we ask for two, mm -hmm. um, but it depends on the institution. Mm -hmm. Really depends on the selectivity of the school right. and how difficult it is. And as long as the person recommending the student knows them well, right, right. that's the most important yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. good. So, um, Saljan from Nepal asked, does applying early mean a better chance of getting a scholarship? Mary Mead, what do you think about that? I'm sorry, Mary Margaret. Okay. Um, <laughs> Apologies. Well, you know, <laughs> Uh, I mean, applying early means that, you know, you're, you're on it, you're on top of your stuff and you're, you're getting it in and, and that's, that's really great. Um, but also there are requirements to get into the university. So you have to meet the GPA level right. um, 
and uh, in English language proficiency requirements. So these things may take more more time. Um, I would say that you know you really want to focus on the quality of your application and be in touch with us. I don't. I think that um, applying early isn't necessarily the most important thing. It is very important. Um, but also your communication with us. I know some students will start an application on their own and get it done and and we don't hear from them at, at all. And that's amazing. Um, uh, but we also have a lot of students who are emailing us and calling us and and we love to hear from you and and help you out. And I think that gives us a better understanding of uh, you know, your story, the story of your your transcript, your financial background, and really what your needs are as a student. And that is important to us in, in the Office of International Admissions at the University of Colorado, Denver. Um, and I think that we're able to give those students who reach out and communicate with us uh, a bit more care um, so that they, they really get what they need. So I don't necessarily think that applying early is like the main thing that will help you get into uh, university. Um, and like I said, reach out, communicate with us. We want to hear what's going on. Right. Now, um, Arwa asked a related question about the specific time of year to apply for U.S. Uh, universities. And um, you mentioned your rolling application uh, process, but usually that's in the fall, correct? Yes. So our main start and the main start for most academic institutions in the U.S. is in the fall, which is in the month of August generally, late, mid to late August sometimes uh, in September, and really that depends on the institution. We have three starts. So we have students who will start in the fall, and that's when the largest group starts, and that's also when there are a lot more activities that are planned. Um, but we also have students that are ready to go, and they wanna start in the spring, which starts in mid to late January. Mm -hmm. And then we have students who are ready to come and start with us in in the summer so that start is usually uh in june so generally because we have a rolling application um, as long as students are admitted and ready to go at least 30 to 45 days out from the start date of the semester um we we allow them to come and and start during that time but i would say that you really want to get your um, application into a school like ours, probably, you know, about three months out, maybe more to give yourself enough time to prepare to come here. Right. And uh, is that a similar case for you all, Gayatri? Yes, at Fairleigh Dickinson, we have two semesters, um, fall and spring. So it's about the same timeline that Mary Margaret mentioned, which is August, end of August is the start of the fall. And so we allow applications all the way through to August 1st if they're living overseas and have to get visas and you know, come and relocate and change uh, destination, basically, their living circumstances. Mm -hmm. uh, but if they're in the United States and if they wanted to transfer in, then it's a different story. They're already within the school system in the U.S., and so it's a lot quicker. So we, even before the start of school, we would consider an application. Um, and outside of the United States, if they're applying to our spring semester in mid-January, we recommend completing the application well before Thanksgiving uh -huh. because of holidays and trying to apply yeah. for a visa, that would be kind of a little bit tricky. Um, but like I said, because of the different calendars, the academic calendars, that's inevitable that students mm -hmm. would apply to spring once they've got all the academic credentials. So there's no specific time that applies to all the schools, unfortunately. Right. But as I said, the sooner you begin, the better really for you. The better, exactly. Yeah, exactly. No time like the present. No, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Start preparing. That's right, that's right. <laughs> so uh, Pato from Argentina would like to know what the process for identifying university programs for student athletes are. Now, that's an interesting question. And uh, again, I think various institutions have specific programs for students. Mary Margaret, um, can you give us a, a, a sampling of maybe what's available at your institution and what you've heard is available at other institutions? Yeah, so we're a bit unique um, because we have a lot of what is called uh, a club sport. 
So students, they decide that they want to have a particular sport. Um, we've got, uh, we have uh, flag football league, soccer, cheerleading. Um, we've got some uh, ultimate Frisbee, right? And so the students have that, that interest and they start the club. Um, they get funding together to have the club. And then those they sometimes play against different institutions, right? Um, then there are the large universities that have their huge uh, football teams and stadiums, and they have they uh, are active in the NCAA, which which is our athletic association. And there are different tiers of uh, sports that are offered. So, right the. Division one is your your really high level uh, sport institution that is going to offer scholarships to attend, um, all the way down to a, a Division three, which is still a very competitive school, um, and they sometimes do offer funding for schools. And each institution has uh, different types of sports: lacrosse, field hockey, you name it. I mean, we really School, there are 4,700 institutions in the U.S., so um, they all have different uh, specialties. And I just was at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, and they said, speaking of sports, that they used to have a requirement that a student needed to pass a swimming test in order to get into the university. So oh um, sports are very valued, activities are very very valued, and it does differ uh, based on the institution that you're going to be attending. Excellent. And Gayatri, please. I wanted to quickly add that uh, Fairleigh Dickinson has two campuses in New Jersey, and one is Division Three and one's Division One. Oh, so our Division One campus has great. athletes that receive athletic funding. Uh -huh. And so it's a very, very important source of funding when it comes to studying overseas and right. studying at an institution in the United States. Um, yes, you will be playing part of a very, very competitive team. Right. We have sports that range from track and field, soccer, mm -hmm. tennis, golf, mm -hmm. fencing, volleyball. You know, so it's, it's a wonderful opportunity and the Division 3 campus is also in northern New Jersey and uh, we have sports teams there so that compete. It's amazing how competitive the NCAA is. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Excellent. Yes. Good. So lots of opportunities for mm -hmm. student athletes out there. Yeah. Now our last question I'm going to ask uh, Tung Vi and um, Gayatri to answer for us. But um, Tung Vi, could you tell us a little bit about the resources that you used as an international yeah. student to get adjusted to living uh, in the United States? Resource. Uh, hi, so uh, I think there are like thousands of resources for international students to like uh, get involved in our school and our um, event, everything. Um, for example, there is one like valuable resource in my school in CU Denver is that the Learning Resource Center is that where we can go there and we can have some advice and mentor for our specific courses that we need somebody to help us. Um, besides that, there is some writing center. This is this is really great. Yeah, it, like we have uh, thousands of assignments in writing and this writing center can help us like correct it in the academic way and help us have a very fancy assignment to submit to our professor. Um, uh, besides that, there is a, um, an advising, advising office where we can go there and to ask about our future career because sometimes we are confusing about what we can do in our future and that office can help us um, answer every question of us and like give us uh, some advice, some very good advice based on our ability, based on our achievement, what we can do, what we can have in our future based on our interest. Mm -hmm. I think it's very, it's very good. Okay. And a lot of resources besides that for international students because uh, we are very new here. We are brand new in the US. So we can get involved to uh, some of that office about international affairs to ask about uh, the upcoming event to get involved to uh, the environment and exposed to a lot of um, US cultures here. Oh. I think very it's very good. great. Good. So you're taking full advantage. That's great to hear. 
Yeah, yes, so just, and I think like we just need to be proactive, be active, and we can get what what we want. Excellent. Very good. And so, Gayatri, what sorts of resources are at uh, FDU? So certainly, um, at FDU we have an international student services office that dedicates itself to helping students acclimate to the culture, mm. to the education system, mm. and we do orientation just upon arrival. Mm. We also advocate students to contact Education USA in their home region so that they can Excellent. do a pre-departure orientation as well. Thank you. Yes. You're welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Just for students who don't know, yes. our Education USA advisors around the world do offer uh, orientation sessions for students heading to the United States, and you can get a lot of good information about what to prepare for and um, how to um, just get ready yes. for the big move and for your big transition to the United States. Yes. And we connect with our students through WhatsApp, Facebook, um, WeChat. Um, and email especially, and students are very vocal about questions, so that's wonderful because Excellent. it's such a mystery. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Yeah. Excellent. Great. Yes. Well, thank you to uh, everybody. Unfortunately, we're almost out of time. Um, but before we uh, end up, I'd like to ask each of our speakers to just give us one piece of advice um, that they would give to prospective students as they're thinking about the college application process. Um, so Tung V, let's start with you. What would be one thing you would tell um, some of your friends that were hoping to do the same thing that you're doing, study in the United States? Okay. Uh, um, I think, like, at first, we have a lot of difficulties when applying for a very strange country that we need to go to study abroad. But I think the only thing we need to remember is that we are on the way to make our dream come true. Mm -hmm. So just be persistent and mm -hmm. be enthusiastic, mm -hmm. be proactive, and like take advantage of everything we, you can, and you can get your dream. You can make your dream come true. Excellent. Thank you. It's very inspiring. So Mary Margaret, what about you? So I would say uh, that you really just make a connection with the, the people who are in the, the Office of Admissions, whether it's the student workers or the, the staff. Um, you know, I think that's really important because uh, V is a great example of this. So she met one of our um, our vice chancellor of the Office of International Affairs at a, um, an event in Vietnam. And then she reached out to us and she emailed us. <laughs> and then she, as soon as she got on campus, she came to our office and she came to say hello. And now she's working in our office. So, you know, make that connection. If you feel like there's someone that, that uh, really is taking an interest in you, that's a really good indicator that when you get to campus, you're going to have people who care about you and who are going to help you to be as successful as possible. So when you get that good feeling that this person really cares, I think that's your institution and that might be the place that you need to go. Mm -hmm. Very good point. Thank you. And Gaitra, I know there's lots of advice that we can pass on to students, but what would be one thing you would leave people with today? If something seems really difficult, ask someone mm -hmm. who knows, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. rather than making assumptions or listening to someone who might not necessarily know. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Clarify and Clarify. ask. Yeah. yeah. We're yeah. here to help and we welcome questions. Right. Excellent. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you to all of you for your excellent comments and insights and advice and for joining us here today. And we'd like to also especially thank all of our viewers. And we have some special viewing groups around the world um, that we would like to uh, give a shout out to. We have our Education USA Gabroni in Botswana, Education USA Center at the Binational Center in Colombo Americano in Bogota, Colombia, our American Space Bauchi in Nigeria, Education USA Abuja in Nigeria as well, our Lahore Center in Pakistan also dialed in today, as well as our U.S. Embassy Kyiv in Ukraine, the American Corner Pristina in Kosovo, the American Corner Jideta in Burundi, the American Corner Welvis Bay in Namibia, and Education USA Managua in Nicaragua. Thank you to everyone for watching today. We're really excited about your participation, about your questions, and um, we're excited about the information that we we're able to share today. 
So for more information about studying in the United States, as you all know well, you can visit our website, educationusa.state.gov, and you can find information about the five steps to study in the United States, as well as where you can find an Education USA center closest to you in your country. And as a reminder, we have close to 435 centers around the world. So there is a center close to you. And our advisors can help connect you with universities, help you through the application process. Um, we also have a lot of information on social media. Um, and we participate in fairs and forums around the world. Um, we have information on financial aid opportunities and much, much more. So thank you again for joining us. And please think about joining us for future Education USA events. You can find out all about those events on our Facebook site. Um, and we'll have more interactive web chats coming uh, very soon. So that's it from us. Thank you to everyone, and goodbye from Washington.